Um, everything we say here is not to be taken as legal advice. Out of curiosity, uh, people here practice elder law? Okay. Sort of, yeah. I trust this day. But, right. Okay. So I, I may uh, turn to those who practice elder law at some point and ask them for, uh, for, for input on this. Uh, but I am, uh, yeah, uh, careful to note, I am not a lawyer. I did not go to law school, and I'm not presenting this uh, as legal advice. Okay. Um, let's get started. Romance and the elderly client. Uh, and here I have to thank Chuck Wagner, who is not here at the moment, but uh, he invited me to participate in a program on this uh, last year, two years ago, and, uh, and that was what got me started thinking about this topic, and he also helped me with some of the cases that, uh, that I'm going to present in number two, the questions that we're going to deal with. Um, take a look, though, at source number one, please. This comes from a paper, The Role of Counsel Pursuant to Section 3 of the Substitute Decisions Act. Section 3 of the Substitute Decisions Act states, Counsel for person whose capacity is in issue. If the capacity of a person who does not have legal representation is in issue in a proceeding under this Act, A, the court may direct that the public guardian and trustee arrange for legal representation to be provided for the person, and B, the person shall be deemed to have capacity to retain and instruct Counsel. So here you have something of a paradox, right? right? Right off the bat. Meaning, the capacity of a person who doesn't have a lawyer is an issue. So it's not clear that this person has capacity. The court may direct that a legal representative be, be, be provided, and the person shall be deemed to have capacity. So even though capacity is an issue, nonetheless, the lawyer who has been appointed for this party is going to have to act as though they actually have the capacity to give instructions. Are we we clear on that? That's what it's saying. So the writer here, Darcy Hiltz, says the following. The lawyer-client relationship normally presupposes that the client has the requisite mental ability to make decisions and instruct counsel. When this ability is lacking, the rules of professional conduct and the rules of civil procedure require a lawfully authorized representative to be appointed to make decisions for the client. That's what normally happens. The difficulty lies in the fact that in proceedings under the Substitute Decisions Act, a litigation guardian is not required for a person whose capacity is an issue. The person whose capacity is an issue is deemed to have capacity to retain and instruct counsel. How do you represent an individual deemed by law to have capacity to to retain and instruct you when, in your opinion, A, the individual is unable to provide instructions, or B, the instructions provided are, in your opinion, not capable instructions, or C, the instructions provided are contrary to the best interests of the individual? Under the SDA, the lawyer can be appointed to follow the instructions of, not only can be, is appointed to follow the instructions and implement the instructions of somebody who the lawyer may feel doesn't have the capacity to actually provide proper instructions or, in fact, may be working against their own best interests in the instructions that they provide. So what is somebody supposed to do if they're appointed as a lawyer in a case like this. That's, that's one of the areas that I want to discuss as part of uh, romance and the elderly client. I am not saying, let me be very, very clear here, I'm not saying that all elderly people are in some way incapable of either entering into a relationship or giving instructions and so on. That is not at all the assumption. However, as somebody becomes older and the risk of dementia grows and de- dementia may indeed develop, these questions become very difficult ones to work with. Clear? Okay. So I'm not asking you yet how you answer Darcy Hiltz's questions in number one, but that's where we're going. You're going to have to have an answer for how how we deal with this. The questions I want to address are, are outlined in number two on the sheet. Number one, what is the definition of capacity for a romantic relationship in Jewish law and in secular law? What is considered to, to, to be the definition of somebody who could enter into a romantic relationship? And let me be clear, romantic relationship can mean marriage, but it doesn't have to be. So that's, that's number one. Number two, Solomon is retained as a lawyer to manage the affairs of Julie. 
who is 90 years old and living in a long-term care, in a long-term care facility. Julie is fully capable, but she is frail and vulnerable. The arrangement was made by, and fees are paid by, Julie's son, Sam, who insists on attending all meetings between Solomon, the lawyer, and Julie, the client. How should Solomon handle the situation? Right, what's the obvious problem here? What's the problem in this, uh, in this question? What is it that Solomon is facing? Well, confidentiality. Who is your client? Right? Exactly. Who is your client? On the one hand, it's, uh, it's Julie's son, Sam, who made all of the arrangements. On the other hand, it's Julie whose affairs are being managed. So the issue of who is the client, which will then lead to questions like the confidentiality point. And then the third item here. Wanda, age 78 and widowed, has a single neighbor, Ron, age 58. Ron and Wanda have become romantically involved. Wanda wants to give away half of her cottage to Ron. Her children object. They have gone to court and argue that their mother does not have the capacity to have romantic relations with Ron or to make such a large gift. Alternatively, they argue that even if she has capacity, her diminution in cognitive ability makes her highly vulnerable to being unduly influenced. They point out that their 78-year-old mother is experiencing moderate dementia, including a relaxing of sexual inhibition. Given that Wanda's capacity is an issue, the court, pursuant to Section 3 of the SDA, which we read in number 1, invites the public guardian and trustee to arrange for legal representation for Wanda. Rhoda is appointed Section 3 counsel. Rhoda believes that Wanda does not have capacity. Wanda does not know the size of her assets, does not remember who her children are, and believes that Ron is her late husband. Wanda instructs Rhoda to fight for her right to gift half the cottage and to allow her to continue her romance with Ron. It is accepted normative practice that Rhoda has to present her client's wishes to the court. May Rhoda withdraw. This sets up the problem that we highlighted in the first source. Right? Rhoda is being asked to implement instructions that she, believe, she believes Wanda is not either capable of giving or, number two, that Wanda is hurting herself by giving. So this is just a, uh, a practical implementation of the question that, that we set up already with, uh, with number one with an added element to it. Right? What's the issue in number three besides the issue of capacity? And besides the issue of being able to represent her and feeling comfortable representing her, what else is involved here? Can she quit? Sorry? Can she quit? Well, that's part of the question of can she withdraw, correct. But there's another item here that's, that's, uh, that's suggested along the way. How, does she, how can she possibly represent her as an individual if she herself doesn't believe she has capacity, then she has to recommend someone has power of attorney. So it would appear, but there's one more issue in the sentence that starts alternatively. Right, undue influence. Even if she has capacity, right, even if she you know, is able to make decisions, there's still a concern that maybe Ron is exerting some pressure that Wanda is vulnerable to. And maybe that's influencing her, uh, her decision to, to give him half the cottage. So that's also something that we're going to have to, that we're going to have to look at. We, there's, yes. There's also another thing. Yes. The statute says she's deemed capacity. Correct. So there's a duty of an officer to the court. Right. So that was right. That was the, the point that we had started with, was the, uh, was the problem that, if you looked at, uh, at number one, there's this apparent conflict between the, what, what we generally say in terms of the, uh, what generally happens for people whose capacity is questioned, and on the other end, what the SDA is ordering. I thank you before, but I'm going to thank you now in person for your help in, uh, in setting this up. Okay. So the first section here, general law. The, the issue of dementia and capacity to carry on a, a romantic relationship. So this is less of a professionalism piece of it and more a practical issue, although professionalism does come into play uh, in terms of sensitivity to the needs of the particular client. So Jewish law, like Canadian civil law, requires consent to enter into a potentially harmful agreement. 
and recognizes that different potentially harmful pursuits require specialized levels of consent. So what, what do you need in order to be able to consent here? So um, that, that's, our, that's our, our, our first point. If you're talking about marriage, if that's the issue here, that we're talking about uh, her desire to actually enter, the client's desire to, uh, to enter into a marriage, so there are a range of views regarding how you define capacity to marry in Canadian law. If you take a look at source number three, this is from a paper called Predatory Marriages by Kimberly Whaley. Um, she actually had a series of papers, some written herself, some written with others, but this I think is the most recent, in which she writes the following. From a historical perspective, after presenting a series of cases, she writes, from a historical perspective, it is apparent that there is no single and complete definition of marriage or of the capacity to marry. Rather, on one end of the judicial spectrum, there is the view that marriage is but a mere contract, and a simple one at that. And that seems to be the older view within law. It's a simple contract, simple to understand, and therefore, if you have general capacity, that's good enough to be able to enter into marriage as well. That's one. Yet on the other end of the spectrum, several courts have espoused the view that the requirement to marry is not so simple. Rather, one must be capable of managing one's person or one's property in order to enter into a valid marriage or both. That's a, that's a higher level of capacity to be able to do that, to be able to manage yourself and potentially also to be able to manage property in the middle, in between those, you have the idea that, uh, or the standard that they have to comprehend the duties they are agreeing to by, uh, by marrying. If you take a look at source number four, this is a paper, People of Faith and Substitute Decision Making, Wagner, Donovan, and Pearl. We can all agree that protecting the vulnerable, incapable person from a predatory marriage makes sense, but raising the threshold for marriage creates other problems. Right? The, you, it's not so simple. If you create a high standard for capacity to marry, now you have a problem. For the incapable person of faith, it means living with someone without the approval of the state or religious authorities. For many, that will be a non-starter. In other words, if someone is not able to marry because we've decided that they don't meet the level of capacity required, then we are preventing them from marrying. And for some people, that will be a very serious prospect. And it could prevent them from entering into the relationship, and maybe we've created a stringency that, uh, that is inappropriate. When representing clients who wish to marry but do not have the capacity under the test articulated to Hunt v. Warrod, it is open for counsel to argue that the case is persuasive authority and not binding. We must wait until the Court of Appeal adjudicates on whether the Banton test or the Hunt v. Warrod test for capacity to marry prevails as the current test in Ontario. The Banton test is much lower than Banton v. Banton. The, uh, the Hunt case is, uh, is more strict. But you have a range of views when it comes to marriage. And when you're talking about entering into a romantic relationship without marriage, so that raises questions in its own right. And I reference here in sources five and six two particular cases. The first one, a Nova Scotia case, and the second case, an Ontario case. And what they required in order to demonstrate the, uh, the capacity to enter into such a relationship. Take a look at number five, please. This is describing a, uh, a case in which it was alleged that, a, that an elderly woman had been taken advantage of. On June 29, 2015, Dr. Meehan was requested to conduct a capacity assessment. Her opinions at the end of, the, of that assessment were as follows. As to financial capacity, Ms. W. had no idea what her finances were. As to her health, she had a, quote, complete lack of insight to her needs and her cognitive state. As to social capacity, Ms. W. was described as somewhat of a loner. As to her capacity to enter into a sexual relationship, Dr. Meehan said, I felt that she lacked capacity there as well, lacked insight, and was unable to remember what happened five minutes previously. It was her view that Ms. W.'s reasoning was impaired, and she would have impairment of her ability to understand her actions and the ramifications that those actions might have. The words that are underlined in these sources are, are those are my own underlining, because that's what I wanted to, to emphasize here. Impairment of her ability to understand her actions and the ramifications of those actions. 
On July 8, 2015, Dr. Meehan was again asked to provide her opinion as to Ms. W's capacity to give informed consent to sexual activity. Dr. Meehan's view was and is that Ms. W could not provide informed consent as she lacked insight, judgment, and reasoning necessary to make a safe decision to engage in sexual activity. She had no short-term memory. Her mid-term memory was impaired. These are functions that are necessary to make safe decisions, and therefore she believes Ms. W would not understand the consequences, and so on. Ms. W exhibits, I'm in paragraph 25, Ms. W exhibits symptoms of dementia with vascular aspects that affect the frontal cortex of the brain. A patient with this condition has a less impaired memory, but also is less inhibited in their conduct. As such, she would be unable to inhibit her inappropriate sexual behaviors. Dr. Meehan is aware that Ms. W was acting in a sexual manner with a male resident at times after May 2015. The emphasis of the, uh, of the opinion here. Yeah. Maybe I'll hear later, but. Yes. Um, what is this case about? Is this a case about a lady getting married? Is she being raped? Um, is she giving us her property? What is the case here? And right, so. Ms. W is having problems making decisions, but. What's sorry? The case? No, if I remember correctly, the, um, the fear was that somebody was, in fact, taking advantage of her. The, it was a sexual uh, assault yeah. case. No, no, it was, not a, it was not a sexual assault case. There was a relation. The fact that it's an R case would indicate that it's a crime. It must be a criminal case. Was it a criminal case? Yeah. It talks about the alleged offense right here. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, I'm just trying to remember because I saw it in another context. It would have to be. It would ha I, yes, you are correct. The, um, there was another piece to this, but I'm not remembering the other piece, so I'm going to go with that because, yes, it says, it, it says R. Fine. Yeah. Right. The, it seems like the defense was she had capacity. Right. 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 No, you're right. The the emphasis, though, in the opinion here is not general capacity, but specifically her ability to understand her actions and to understand the ramifications of those actions. If you take a look at uh, at the the next one, at Salzman v. Salzman, this is one in which you're not talking now about a uh, about a criminal case, but this is one where you're talking about a son who is concerned about his mother's relationship. So the undisputed evidence of Mr. Saltzman, that's the son, and Ms. Saltzman's full-time caregivers is that Ms. Saltzman cannot see to her own nutrition and accuses her caregivers of trying to poison her. She has no concept of hygiene. She does not do self-cleaning, will not change her diapers after she relieves herself. She can get lost if she leaves her apartment alone. She does not take her medication without reminders, is unaware of her health conditions past or present, has lost orientation to time and place, and has no recall. She lacks an awareness of safety. She left an electric heater beside the couch all night, attempts to leave her apartment to take taxis in only a nightgown or house coat. Taxis no longer answer her calls. Makes dozens of calls every day, often to perfect strangers. Made almost 496 long-distance calls during the month ending April 10th, 2011. Asks random men out on dates. Dr. Greif, a colon and rectal surgeon who first saw Ms. Saltzman in May of 2008 in connection with her recently diagnosed colon cancer and has seen her a number of times since, including December 2010. He confirms that Ms. Saltzman has little or no understanding of her medical conditions, including her progressive dementia. He confirms that Ms. Saltzman suffers from significant and worsening dementia and is sometimes irrational. He wrote, Suzanne Saltzman does not possess cognitive abilities to insightfully consent to or refuse sexual activity. She lacks insight to understand potential risks of any sexual behavior such as infectious diseases or trauma. This is particularly important because the man who, is, uh, who she's in the relationship with is engaging in sexual activities with her which are considered harmful activities in and of themselves. So she is engaging in this. She does not have the capacity to do so. Section 3, but she argues that she wants the relationship to continue and she wants everything to, uh, to continue and she wants to provide things for the gentleman who she's in the relationship with and she has Section 3 counsel. So Section 3 counsel argues that no weight should be given to Dr. Greif's opinion because he did not conduct a full capacity assessment. I disagree. Moreover, his opinion is supported by the evidence generally as to Ms. Saltzman's mental state and by the nature and circumstances of a conduct at issue and the character of Mr. Balak, which is a whole other story, the gentleman who is involved. The, um... Yes. But the... Sorry? 
So Mr. Balak has a history of his own, uh, on his own before this relationship, and it's not pretty. The, um, and you read it and you think, well, it, you know, yeah, this is, this is somebody who, um, who is taking advantage of the, uh, the elderly woman involved. So from a secular perspective, you have a range of views as to what constitutes capacity regarding marriage, ranging from marriage is a simple contract, yes or no, um, to you have to comprehend the duties you're agreeing to in marriage, ranging to you have to be able to manage property, which is more sophisticated. When you're dealing with sexual relationships, there's an added element here of a comprehension of the risks and consequences that are involved. What about when you're dealing with halacha? What about when you're dealing with Jewish law? So Jewish law recognizes normally three types of incapacity. The first is minority, when you're dealing with a minor. I gave you an illustration of it in source number seven from the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law, which talks about a minor under the age of six. Before the age of six, a minor's gift to others is nothing. A minor tries to give something away. We don't recognize it as a valid gift. Between six years and maturity, if he understands commerce, then his purchase, his sales, his gifts are all valid. The, uh, between six years and maturity, maturity you can assume right now is 13, although in fact it does vary for certain areas of commerce within Jewish law. So the first type of incapacity is simply being underage, and we treat that person under the age of six as though they have no comprehension no matter what. Between the age of six and maturity, maybe they can demonstrate that they that they understand. Second is some kind of dysfunction related to an illness, physical, intellectual, or emotional dysfunction. If you take a look at source number eight, you find a good summary of this point. Rabbi Yaakov Yeshaya Blau was a Dayan, was a judge on a rabbinical court in Israel, one of the leading judges in Israel. He passed away about three or four years ago, and he wrote the following. He's talking about issues of incapacity, and he says, logically, he would extend the incapacity of the minor. He says, it appears the same would be true for a patient whose mind was not organized sufficiently to take care of himself. He would have the status of a cheresh, or an insane person, for this purpose, meaning for the purpose of care of property. The word cheresh is a loaded word. That's why I didn't translate it. In loosely, it's somebody who is deaf and mute, possibly from birth. But because there's a lot of discussion about this, and particularly its application today, keeping in mind that when Talmudic literature discussed somebody who was deaf and mute 2,000 years ago, um, they didn't have the means of evaluating the person's function. They didn't have the means of teaching, which we have, uh, had, had, we've, which we've had in schools for the last few centuries. The, um, so that's why I leave the word cheresh untranslated. It requires its own discussion. But the point that they're making here is if you have somebody whose mind is, as the Hebrew writes, his mind is not organized sufficiently to take care of himself, that person is deemed incapable of caring for property, <coughs> and therefore the court will be obligated to appoint an apotropos, to appoint a guardian. And certainly someone whose mind is literally torn due to age, and that's a reference to dementia. So the, the, uh, the case here he's talking about is, as in the Hebrew, a chola, in the English, a, uh, a patient, somebody who's suffering from some form of illness. That's your second, uh, that's your second category. And then your third is in source number nine. And this is Maimonides writing on the laws of testimony, who qualifies to serve as a witness in a, in a court case. And he says, I'm going to read the English on the sources in general, the interests of time, but you have the Hebrew in front of you as well. Those who are especially foolish, called in Hebrew a petty, who do not recognize contradictory statements, do not understand matters as other normal people do. Also, those who are confused and hasty in their minds, and those who are especially foolish, are in the category of shotim. A shota is somebody who is legally um, deemed insane in Jewish law. 
it is as the judge sees it, one cannot specify a mindset in writing. He says, I can't give you more detail, more specifics. He said, I'm going to stick with what you see, you know, what, what he has written so far, which is somebody who doesn't recognize contradictory statements, doesn't understand the way that people normally do, someone who is confused and hasty, someone who is foolish, and he says the judge is going to have to evaluate it on site. But people who seem to have poor comprehension or irrational in their thought processes are people who are, in this case that he's talking about, incapable of providing testimony in court, and not just incapable of applying testimony in court, which is his specific context, but it may apply in other areas of Jewish law as well. So you have three different types of incapacity. You have the person who is a minor. You have the person who is dealing with an illness that um, we described in, uh, in number eight is, is, is causing disorganized thinking. The, um, or you have somebody who has a level of incapacity which includes a broad range of traits, poor comprehension, irrational thought processes, inappropriately hasty. You see it in number 10 also, Rabbi Yeshua Falk writing in his commentary to the Shulchan Aruch, to the Code of Jewish Law, a, uh, a similar set of, uh, of traits. This isn't marriage specific. This is just to show you a range of traits that are defined as, um, as problematic in terms of a person's capacity. What about when we get towards the issue of a sexual relationship? At that point, what, do we, what, what, what is our standard of capacity within, uh, within Jewish law? So it's interesting. I have not seen a separate discussion about capacity for marriage. Meaning, you have the general discussions about capacity for Jewish law purposes... And we will see there is an issue of capacity for a sexual relationship. But nothing about a person being considered to have capacity in Jewish law in general, let's say to sell land, but not having capacity for marriage. The, uh, or having capacity for, and fill in the blank, any area of any activity, but not for marriage. That I have not, uh, that I have not found. What there is, is in terms of capacity to consent to, as I said, a, uh, a sexual relationship. One set of sources indicates that, the, uh, that if somebody lacks capacity, and we have to talk about what that capacity is, the, uh, but, if, but if somebody lacks, well, I don't want to put the cart before the horse. Let's take a look at the source. Source number 11 and source number 12, and then we'll come back to the sentence I didn't complete. And the Talmud writes, Pitoi kitana ones hu. Seduction of a minor, seducing a minor, is an act of rape. The next text, the Pitchei Tshuva commentary to the Shulchan Aruch, says not only minors, but this is going to apply to an adult who lacks capacity. Take a look at source number 12. He quotes a story which, uh, which was brought in a responsum by an author, the book is called Mekom Shmuel. I believe it is 18th century. He says, See response to Mekom Shmuel, number 25, regarding a woman who left her senses and became insane, Rahman al She went about with her hair wild, lay literally unclothed in the dump, and a non-Jew found her and lay with her with her consent. She was later healed, and she returned to her senses. And the question is, may she return to her husband? The issue underlying this is that Jewish law would say that if a man and a woman are married, and then she is involved in a relationship outside of the framework of marriage, then at that point, she and her husband are prohibited to each other. So this woman, when she was in this state... uh, which was described as having left her senses, she was involved with somebody. However, she has now come back to her senses. Could she return to her husband? Could you argue that what went on while she was in this state did did not constitute an act of infidelity? What it constituted was rape. That's the question at hand. And he, Mekom Shmuel, wrote about this at length, prohibiting, saying she's not like a minor. In number 11, we saw that seducing a minor is considered rape. But he says, that's not the case here. Since we saw she desired this, we must be concerned that perhaps this was willing as well, and her thoughts can be discerned from her deeds. That's the first, that's the first piece that he brings, yes. What if she was sleepwalking? 
So you'll have to define sleepwalking. Meaning, if you mean literally that she wasn't conscious... She was not conscious, she was sleepwalking. Then you don't have an issue. If she's genuinely sleepwalking, if she's genuinely asleep, then it's clear-cut rape, no? Okay. Why wouldn't it be? Thank you. Okay. The... Yeah. Rape would... Uh, would permit her to return to her husband. Correct. There no would be no... Correct. If it's involuntary, then she's able to go back to her husband. The question is, was this willing or not? So the first author quoted says, he believes, since she is willing, therefore, we view, or, yeah, as he puts it, we see that she desired this, therefore, she's not able to go back to her husband. Therefore, we treat this as an act with consent. But then he says, to see Binat Adam, Binat Adam, written by um, the same as the author of the Chochmat Adam, Chayei Adam. He says, this is in, in the 19th century now, see Binat Adam regarding a story like this. But in his case, it was not certain that there had been sexual relations. He has a, a nuance in the case. They weren't sure something happened, only that she went about with soldiers and it was near certain that sexual relations had taken place. He wrote that the Makom Shmuel's position was rejected. For desire is not the same as will at all. Meaning, to put it in, a, in more contemporary terms, the fact that somebody has sexual desire does not mean that they are able to consent. Their participation does not constitute consent. In truth, one who is insane is like a minor, and he quotes Mishnah Lamelech, a much earlier source, and perhaps one who is insane is of even lesser capacity than a minor. And Rabbi Akiva Eger cited Mishnah Lamelech and wrote simply that a chereshet, which is the female version of the cheresh term we quoted earlier, or incompetent person would be like a minor, seduction would be viewed as rape. So the argument is that the, the adult who is not capable of consenting has the same status as a minor, and therefore their consent is meaningless. That's the argument, that's the conclusion that, uh, that Binat Adam comes to as quoted here in Pitchei Tshuva. So that the, the standard here, the standard for, defi- for defining consent is not simply did, it, did they look like they wanted to do this, but did they have a level of comprehension such that we would say there was true consent going on. Now I have to say that other sources are less clear on this. If you take a look at source number 13, Rabbi Moses Maimonides, the Rambam writes, if a minor who was married off by her father commits zinut, she is prohibited to her husband. He's talking about a minor. Leave aside the question of marrying off minors. Yes, it's a bad idea. Yes, it has always been a bad idea. And it was frowned on Talmudically and thereafter. (coughs) Nonetheless, it existed. Generally speaking, for financial reasons. But But Maimonides says... If, uh, if she's a minor and then she gets involved in zinut, zinut is an act of sexual immorality, then she is prohibited to her husband, suggesting that, in fact, she can consent. And there's a lot of discussion about what his basis is for this, because the Talmud in number 11 seems fairly clear that she doesn't seem able to provide consent at all. So there's a lot of discussion about this. But as a matter of law, the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law, sides against Maimonides. He brings both points of view in number 14, but the, the, uh, the general consensus is that his conclusion is to side with the view that no, there is no consent on the, uh, on the part of a minor, and applying the logic of Binat Adam that we saw quoted in Pitchei Tshuva, the same thing would be true dealing with an adult who, um, who lacks capacity. Now, what we've seen then, and this is not a, a full comprehensive discussion, but I, what I hope we've seen at this point is that from a, from, from a Jewish law perspective, there is a standard of capacity required in order to demonstrate, cons- in order to provide consent for sexual interaction, even if there is not regarding marriage, and we have a range of possibilities for what defines lack of capacity, because we saw illness, and we saw dementia, and we saw the disorganized thought, you know, inappropriate haste. The, um, what we didn't get into, and what we would require in order to have a full discussion of this, is the question of, so which of these will you apply in the context of sexual relations? Will we go back to the standard of they have to understand
understand the consequences of what they're doing? Will we look for a rational thought process? And that's where they, um, that's where a, a full discussion of the Jewish law aspect of this would uh, would take us. I just wanted to give an introduction that would that would demonstrate some of the issues that are involved. Mrs. Woody. I, I don't remember where I got this from. I know that, that every year when we hear the discussion of, of the marriage of, of Isaac and, and, and Rebecca, yes. um, we at least hear that there is uh, that they ask her, despite the fact that she's apparently a child at the time, they ask her, and that from there I just remember hearing that um, in order to be married, that a woman had to be at least old enough, a girl would have to be at least old enough to say that she wanted to be married to this person. Yeah. So presumably the capacity to know who was being talked about and what being married meant. Right. Um, is that not a lot of concept? I, I, I guess right. I don't remember the sources. Right. So, so Ms. Witte points, that, points out, this is um, yeah, a, a particularly interesting story. The... Um, to first present it the way the biblical record has it. The story of the binding of Isaac, right, Akedat Yitzchak, is immediately followed biblically by the story of his mother's death, which is immediately followed by the story of Isaac's marriage to Rebecca. The stories are presented one after the other after the other. We know certain ages you know, when these events take place. We are not told at the binding of Isaac, at Akedah Yitzchak, we're not told how old he is. We don't know. What we do know is that the next story, his mother's death, happens when he is 37 years old. That we do know. And we know that the... Um, that the that I'm sorry, I skipped one, one key point. In between the binding of Isaac and his mother's death, we're told that a whole bunch of cousins have been born to him, including Rivka, who he ends up marrying. That's the key point. They, um, we know that right after that, he is 37, and we know that he's 40 when he marries Rivka. So the, the, um, the suggestion found in some of the Midrashim, some rabbinic writing on it, is that, indeed, he was 37 when Rivka was born, and therefore he becomes married to her when he's 40, and she is three years old. That's the, uh, that's the suggestion in some of the Midrashim. As I recall, the writers on that Midrash who say that, she, uh, that she's three suggest that there is no sexual involvement until she is mature. In other words, even though, and we know that there, she doesn't have any child until, you know, for 20 years after that. But, but, um, but even though there may be some kind of agreement to marry going on earlier, there's no sexual activity taking place at that time. I would also note the other Midrashim, which Tosvo comment, uh, bring on the, on the Gemara there, that no, she's actually not that young and the chronology need not be read that way. There's no reason to have to think that her birth was actually when he was 37, the, uh, based on the text itself. However, um, yes, within the view that she is actually three years old, you would still require a statement of will. The, um, that, that, that would seem to be so. Okay. So that's all been uh, a, a little bit of discussion about, uh, about capacity in Canadian law as well as in Jewish law. Let's get to the, uh, the two hard professionalism cases. First of all, dealing with Julie's son, Sam, who we mentioned in the introduction, was the one who arranged for Julie. If you remember the, uh, the, the case that I gave at the outset, otherwise you can look back at number two. We said that Julie is 90 years old. She is capable, but her son Sam arranges for this uh, lawyer Solomon to take care of her affairs, and Sam wants to sit in on all the meetings between Solomon the lawyer and Julie. So the issues we're going to have to deal with here are, as you see in number 15, determining who the client is, recognizing and being sensitive to the client's circumstances, special needs, and intellectual capacity, as well as, depending on uh, how difficult Sam may be, managing difficult clients. So, first of all, in this scenario, who is the client? 
Sorry? Somebody said Sam. Julie is the client. Right. The majority view at the table, which I'm glad I, I'm on the side of, the, uh, is that Julie is, the, uh, Julie is the client here. If you take a look at source number 16, the, uh, from the licensing process examination study materials of 2012, which is why it says LSUC, because they still were the LSUC at that point. Yes, I know they're now the LSO. Um, once a lawyer agrees to act for a prospective client, the prospective client becomes a client. A retainer or an agreement for legal services may be created either formally or informally. Once the lawyer has agreed to provide legal services, the lawyer-client retainer has been established, and the lawyer has the additional duty to provide legal services competently, as discussed later in these materials. So the client is the person for whom you are acting, not the person who is paying the bill. If you take a look at number 17, you find a clearer statement of it from the BC Center for Elder Advocacy and Support. They're quoting a paper from the American Bar Association. The client is the person whose interests are most at stake in the legal planning or legal problem. The client is the one, the only one, to whom the lawyer has professional duties of competence, diligence, loyalty, and confidentiality. It is possible in some circumstances for more than one family member to be clients of the same lawyer. This is common with married couples. However, in most of our cases, we will identify the elder or disabled person as our client. We will do this regardless of who first contacted us. Why is this so? Why isn't it, Sam? Right, the son of Julie. Sam, who's the one who came to the lawyer and said, I would like to hire you, I would like to retain you in order to take care of my mother's affairs. Why is Sam not the client? Because it's his mother's affairs. Yeah, the, mother, the mother's interests are what we're looking after. Right, and why do we go based on that? She's competent. She's competent, that's true. She'd be the client even if she wasn't competent, right? She may not be able to give instructions, but she would be the client. But the cottage doesn't belong to her son. She could decide to sell it. She could decide to give it to someone else. It's, it's not his Yeah. Interest. Okay. I'm still... It's about her life. It's about her interests. Right. Yeah, I, it, I, as I understand it, it goes back to the lawyer's duty to the profession as a whole, and the lawyer's duty transcends the question of who is writing the check. The, um, meaning, the responsibility of the lawyer is to take care of this, this might be what people are saying in just in different words, but the responsibility of the lawyer is to take care of her needs and to do so in a way that is responsible to her and in her best interest. That's, that's how you practice. That's how you, you fulfill your duty. You were unsure, Rachel, about uh, well, if she's incapacitated. If she's, if she's incapable yeah. and the son is, is the attorney under a power of attorney, ah. then, then you're advising the son right. how to exercise his power of attorney. Right. If the son is, is if the son has power of attorney, then then yeah, I think that uh, that in, that is an interesting nuance. And she's, and she's right. Me. Yeah. Yes. I hear that. But there's a there's another issue too. Yeah. Even if mom's capable, the son is allowed to have a lawyer. It may very well be that the son is reta- the son retains the first lawyer, and the first lawyer, and then that first lawyer refers mom to some. Uh, lawyer who is esteemed the profession beyond reproach, like Rachel, that says, you act for mom, I act for son. Right. So what you have to do in a case like what was suggested was that the son may well say, well, I need representation also, and may come to, in our case, it's, um, it's Solomon, and say, I want you to represent my interest. But what Solomon has to do at that point is detect conflict of interest concerns, and can't represent both if there's going to be a conflict in their interest, which there may well be. So, so the, you know, Solomon has to be alert to that. The other thing Solomon has to be alert to is the phantom client phenomenon. If you take a look at source number 18, phantom client in this case refers to somebody who thinks they're a client, as Sam seems to think. 
So again, from the Law Society's licensing uh, study materials, to avoid the problem of phantom clients, lawyers should clearly establish when they have or have not been retained to provide legal services. Lawyers should clearly communicate what role they will fulfill for the client and should confirm in writing whether they will act for a client who has consulted with them and refer to any limitation periods, inform third parties who attend meetings with a client that they do not represent them and represent the client only, discourage clients from requesting legal advice for third parties or from relaying information that the lawyer has provided to the client, right? That's really big in this case, right? The, uh, when Solomon is talking to Julie and Julie decides that she wants to talk to Sam about what's going on, it has to be very clear that, um, that, that Solomon is not acting on behalf of Sam. And avoid discussing legal matters outside the working environment or any working relationships. So what has to happen at this point is that, um, that Solomon has to best take care of the needs of Julie, since Julie is the client. Now, in, in, uh, we, we have a couple of concerns here. Right? We have the concern for the, uh, the needs of, uh, of Julie just in her own right. We also have a concern for potential influence by Sam on Julie. Right? Separate from any concern that we have for how Julie's affairs are managed in general, the fact that Julie has a son, Sam, who might exert influence on his mother's decisions creates an additional problem. Take a look at source number 19. We referred to undue influence in the introduction. But here you see a, uh, a, a simple uh, description. The doctrine of undue influence is an equitable principle used by courts to set aside certain transactions, as well as planning and testamentary documents, where through exertion of the influence of the mind of the donor, the mind falls short of being wholly independent. Lawyers, when taking instructions, must be satisfied that clients are able to freely apply their minds to making decisions involving their estate planning and related transactions. Many historical cases address undue influence in the context of testamentary planning, though more modern case law demonstrates that the applicability of the doctrine extends to other planning instruments, powers of attorney, interview those gifts, and wealth transfers. The, um, so you have to watch out for influence by Sam on Julie's affairs, and you have to be concerned about confidentiality issues. If you take a look at source number 20, this is again from the Law Society's materials. Even when it is apparent what organization, individual, or group of individuals is the client, situations may arise during the retainer that create confusion as to who has proper authority to provide the lawyer with instructions on the client's matter. This may occur when the client brings a friend or family member who is not involved in the matter to meetings with the lawyer, when a third party pays for the lawyer's services, like our case, or when the lawyer represents more than one client in the same matter. The friend, family member, or third party may try to instruct or ask the lawyer to reveal information about the client to ensure no misunderstanding about the involvement or authority of the third party as it relates to the client's matter, the lawyer should meet with the client privately to obtain direction as to how the lawyer should deal with the third party. The lawyer should also confirm in writing the client's directions concerning the third party and any subsequent changes to those directions. If the third party is also a client or if the third party is authorized to give instructions on behalf of the client, the lawyer may take instructions or reveal information. If not, the lawyer must confirm with the client whom the lawyer may speak with regarding the client's matter. So there are all sorts of issues that the lawyer has to be alert to in managing this. The lawyer has to know who the client is. The lawyer has to look after the needs of the client specifically, has to be concerned about undue influence, has to clarify to Sam in this case that Sam is not the client in order to avoid the phantom client phenomenon, and has to, has to make sure to maintain confidentiality, find out what the, uh, the client wants. In number 21, I just gave you a link to a, uh, to a good list of things to look for in terms of undue influence. What about within halacha? Yes? Just a quick note about practice. In real life, I don't do this type of work, but I sue lawyers who do. In real life, it's very hard sometimes when the elderly client says, I trust my daughter slash son. They have to be in every meeting. Uh, Lawyers have to take copious notes about what they're doing. It's the key to protect yourself downstream. And uh, 
sometimes you have to be willing to walk away from a client if you can't, if you can't, if they won't allow you to take notes or if they won't allow you to have that separate conversation. Rachel, you you dealt with this a million times. What do you do? Um, I'll usually have a, another person in the room from my firm or another, uh, you know, mm-hmm. another associate or another partner to take notes to make, and you have to make sure you're taking notes really. I mean, I'm glad you, you said that. Really fulsome notes about not just what people are saying, but what you know. How how what is the person? Demeanor. What are they wearing? What are they? You know, are they? Health are, issues. Are, yeah, you ask them questions about uh, medication. And that kind of thing. You're yeah, talking about. Right, you're talking take the sun out of the room. Right, but you're talking about taking notes in terms of capacity issues. It sounds like. Yeah, but even under influence also. Issues. Under it's influence all also. <laughs> okay. Together. Okay. Was that audible at that end of the table? The, um, the, other the points that are being made here are about the need to take copious notes and careful notes within meetings with the client, um, kicking out the one who's not the client, but also in order to be in, in order to ensure that number one capacity um, is actually there and to demonstrate that and verify it, and also in terms of making sure that you're that, that you're clear of undue influence. In the, in the client's decision making. The other the other thing that is a good practice note is that sometimes when you have an elderly person, capacity is contingent on the complexity of the document being executed. Right. So if it's a five thousand page will, it's going to be a lot more difficult to establish capacity than if it's a, a simple will. So some people will draft the will send the, the elderly person to a capacity assessor, and then based on that capacity assessment, go through it. Right. But Rabbi, I just want to point one other thing for reality purposes. Yes. For those people that are doing $100 wills, or $250 wills, these rules are very hard to comply with. Because? Because the client doesn't want to pay the money. Uh-huh. And it doesn't pay for a lawyer who, who for $100 it takes a half an hour's worth of work to fill all these wills up. That's why I think a lot of the lawyers who run into trouble are the ones who are uh, doing economically uh, affordable wills. Because a will a will that's done properly is costing in the thousands of dollars, not the hundreds of dollars. Interesting. And the capacity assessment also costs five. And it depends on it. It depends on what you need, but minimum of I don't know, I think least I've seen this 1,500 to 2,000 yeah. for someone who's just capacity to instruct the council. Mm-hmm. We don't do wills, but for personal injury. Got it. So you're saying that if, you, if the lawyer is doing this quickly, right, which is essentially what it comes down to when it's being done cheaply, then paying attention to the issues of who the client is and paying attention to the issues of capacity and undue influence isn't going to happen. That's what, that's what I'm hearing from you. I mean, you have to spend the time talking to the point. Yeah. A lot of this depends on whether Sam has brothers and sisters. Oh, boy. In other words, whether they're competitors for the assets and um, whether he's leaving his mother enough money to live the life that they would expect. Right. Type of thing. Right. That's for sure true. The, the case can become much more complicated. <laughs> you got that. Okay. From a Jewish law perspective, it gets interesting. Certainly much is the same as the secular system. You still have to protect the interests of the vulnerable elderly person. You still have to clarify to the child, to Sam, um, where the client identity lies. And you still have to watch out for undue influence. Here's an interesting comment in source number 22. It takes us back into our discussion about minors and capacity, but it speaks to something much broader about undue influence. He's talking about, or Rabbi Doberish Rappaport is talking about the, the, um, the case of the minor who was seduced. And take a look at what he says in source number 22. And see Yeshua Yaakov, a 19th century work, who justified Rambam's ruling, the ruling of Maimonides, that a minor has will and so becomes prohibited in the event of a seduction. And he concluded, this Yeshua and Yaakov concluded, that a minor has thought, meaning that their consent is recognized, when the thought is recognized from his deeds. 
therefore, a minor cohabits willingly without the adult's seduction, but only her desire for this zinut, for the immorality, then since her thought is recognizable that she is willingly cohabiting with him, she is prohibited to her husband. But where the adult persuades her to the point of cohabitation, for this is what happens with minors, that they listen to others, then her action does not prove her desire to commit zinut. He, what he's suggesting, before the earlier work, Yeshua Yaakov is suggesting, is that the adult may well exert undue influence on the minor, at which point the minor's consent is not valid. And he says, Rabbi Rappaport says, for my part, I would say that in truth, even regarding an adult with capacity, we find that that which a person does due to the persuasion of others is not considered entirely willing. So, in other words, the first author, Yeshua Yaakov, makes the argument that if a minor is persuaded to do something, they are not said to have capacity. And what Rabbi Rappaport expands from that is, not just a minor, but in general, adults who are persuaded and pushed into doing something are not said to have consented. This is, uh, you know, th- this is a, a statement that, indeed, undue influence may well um, may well disqualify someone's actions. And he goes on. He brings sources to support it. I just didn't bring the full text here. Well, we'll talk there, because what that, that leads to is that anything that I do, I say, well, like, you made me do it. Yes. Well, I, that doesn't make sense. Then, then, you can, then, then you're going to have to investigate and, and, and determine. So what was the extent of the influence? How did it happen? How influential was it? But that's exactly what he's saying. That's exactly what he's saying. Yeah. yeah. Jared. Um, First of all, I want to, I want to ask, we're, not, we're assuming we're not talking about cases of fraud. We're talking about, what do you mean? Uh, well, fraud, there's an element of deception <clears throat> with regards to... The oh, you mean that somebody cheated the person? In, no, that's not our issue. Our issue is where they knew what they were doing. They knew what they were doing, and they were, and they were goaded into doing it. Right. So, on some level, you could have a perfectly, uh, for the sake of... Better, lack of a better word, someone who is in perfect capacity, who is convinced to do something, um, and so where do you draw, then, then the question becomes, where do you draw the line, because I could say that any act I do has some influence from external, it's the nurture versus nature. Yes, and that's and that's right, and that's where that's where this becomes challenging. What I'm trying to show you is simply that the concept exists. In Jewish law, the concept of undue influence exists. Not the uh, the, uh, the court is going to now have to determine what to what extent that actually existed. It's not as though you're going to find a lot of case law on it. There isn't a lot of case law on it. They, um, but the court is going to have to sit there and analyze and say, well, here's what happened, and this is what we think. Was this decision actually made freely? Yeah. It's important to note that. I mean, that's a good. That's a good. Uh, it's a good point in terms of the language. The difference between uh, influence and undue influence. Everybody's influenced, right? The, the you know the person tried to sell me the car and he gave me uh, a whole rundown about all of its wonderful qualities. That's influence. Is that undue influence? No, of course not. The um, so so yes, that 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 that's something that again the court's going to have to look at. But there's an added element here within the Jewish law way of looking at this case. At the meeting, at, uh, at Sam's desire to sit in on Julie's meetings with Solomon. Yes, you have, to, you have to protect Julie's interests. Yes, you have to tell him, you have to tell Sam that Julie is actually the client. And yes, you have to protect Julie from undue influence from Sam. All of those points are true. However... From a halachic perspective, from the perspective of Jewish law, the child has a legitimate duty to take care of the parent. And the lawyer has to be careful not to prevent the child from fulfilling that role. First of all, 
the child has the same responsibility that anyone has to anyone else. Lo ta'amod al dam reyecha, as I brought you in source number 23, if you see somebody else is going to get hurt, you have a responsibility to intervene on their behalf so that Sam can legitimately say, I'm just taking care of my mother. I need to be involved in order to protect her. That's number one. Number two... Members of a family have a duty to take care of other members of the same family. So that in source number 24, I brought you a passage out of the Talmud which speaks about how we, how we uh, disperse funds for charitable purposes. And the rule is that you take care of your own family, your own poor, as it's worded in my translation, first before others. And you take care of local needs before needs that are elsewhere. So the child can say, I am looking after my family member. And then third, the child has a duty as part of honoring the parent to preserve the dignity of the parent. Take a look at source number 25. Oops, I forgot to translate it on the sheet. So I'll translate it now. The, um, the Talmud asks, Ezu mora vezu kibud. The Torah presents two commandments regarding taking care of one's parents. One is kavod, honor one's parents, and the other is morat, to revere one's parents. And the Talmud asks, what exactly is the definition of honor, and what exactly is the definition of reverence? Mora, if they do first, Mora is reverence. Lo omed bimikomo, lo yoshev bimikomo. You don't stand where the parent normally stands. You don't sit down in the parent's seat. Lo soteret devara, lo machrio. You don't contradict the parent. If there's some kind of public dispute going on and the parent says something, the child is not allowed to say, I think my parent is right, because that shows a certain sense of my parent needs me to support their point of view. These are all under reverence. And then kibud, honor, machilu mashke malbishu mechase machnis umotzi, is to provide the parent with food, to feed the parent, to clothe the parent, to help the parent get around. These are all duties towards the parent, and it's geared towards preserving the dignity of the parent, perhaps best seen in source number 26, which talks about taking care of a parent who develops dementia. If one's father or mother develops dementia, he should try to act according to their wishes until God has mercy upon them. If he cannot bear it because they have become extremely irrational, he should leave and instruct others to manage them in the manner befitting them. That's all other discussion about taking care of one's parents and whether one is entitled to uh, farm it out, so to speak, to hire somebody else to, uh, to do it. But what you see here is that there's a basic responsibility to take care of the needs of the parent. That doesn't mean you listen to everything they tell you to do. If they ask you to do something that is actually bad for them, then you don't listen. Source number 27, Maimonides writes, if one's father tells him to violate the Torah, and dot, 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 he shall not listen. If you flip the page, it talks about a child providing certain medical care for a parent. And Maimonides again writes, one who lets blood for his father or amputates his flesh or limb as a doctor is not liable. Ideally, he shouldn't be the one to do this because a child is not allowed to wound a parent. So ideally, you should find somebody else to take care of this. But if there's no one else who can do it, then the child takes care of the parent. These are duties that the child has towards the parent, taking care of the parent's dignity, um, executing their instructions, but overriding their instructions in the event that their instructions are, in fact, incorrect or bad. Now, the child has to make an assessment. The child needs to exercise judgment, and the child had better be right. But the, the point that I'm trying to make here, what I'm trying to, to show is that whereas from a legal analysis we look at it and say the child has no say, from the standpoint of Jewish law, the child has a responsibility so that the expectation has to be that the lawyer maintain primary focus on the client. The lawyer has to tell the child, you are not my client. The lawyer has to protect the client from the child if need be. But at the same time, the lawyer should be understanding and try to help the child insofar as the child is legitimately fulfilling what is a religious duty. 
the, uh, not to say, well, it's not my problem, I'm not concerned for you, but to understand where the child may be coming from and to, to, to try to help to the extent that one can, again, without working against one's client, who is fundamentally Julie in, uh, in our case. That's, the, uh, that's what I'm suggesting here. Jared, you waited patiently. Um, so there's, there seems to be a distinction here, though, between responsibility and control. Um, so whereas Sam has a responsibility to act with regards to, quite frankly, the information at his disposal, it doesn't necessarily imply that he has access to additional information that Julie Correct. may or may not want to provide. No, if Julie doesn't want to provide the information, then Sam doesn't have any right to it. Meaning this doesn't mean that Sam, is, this doesn't give Sam power of attorney. That's not, that's not what this does. What it does is it says that if he becomes aware that Julie is doing something that is harmful to her and he wants to take a step to help, insofar as he's within bounds, that's to be respected. If he wants to do something that, that's not within his rights, that's a different story. But the, um, the point is simply not to exclude him and say, well, you're not the client and therefore you have no role here. To recognize that, that, again, coming under cultural sensitivity, from a Jewish perspective, there is a role, and there is a, uh, and there's a responsibility, and therefore, the, um, Sam is not necessarily coming here from a bad place and shouldn't be discounted out of hand. That's the, uh, that's the idea. How this is carried out in practice may involve telling Sam, go talk to your rabbi. In all seriousness, the, uh, the lawyer may have to say to Sam, Sam says, look, I'm just trying to take care of my mother. This is my obligation. I have to do it. So tell Sam, listen, I'm your lawyer. I'm not your rabbi. Um, I can't, yeah, I, I'm doing the best I can with it, but you're going to have to go seek guidance from your rabbi about what role you should be playing here. Especially when there are other. Especially, yes, go back to the That's point that this case can become a lot more complicated if there are other siblings involved. The, um, okay, one more issue here. The reluctant lawyer. Right? That's the case that we brought back in number two. I'm not going to read through the entire long case again, but if you remember the, uh, the, the guts of it, Wanda is 78 years old. She has a neighbor named Ron, age 58. They are romantically involved. Wanda wants to give away half her cottage to Ron. The, um, Wanda's children say she does not have capacity, and even if she does, there's concern for undue influence. They, um, they, uh, they, they, they actually go to court to challenge the gift. The court says that given that there's concern about her capacity, we are going to give her Section 3 counsel, which, as we've already said, means that she can give instructions to Section 3 counsel, even though we're not really sure about her, uh, about her capacity. So Wanda tells her lawyer, Rhoda, I want you to fight this. I want you to make sure that I can give half the gift, half the cottage to, uh, to Ron. Rhoda thinks that this is absolutely unacceptable. Rhoda says she doesn't have capacity. This is a terrible decision. This whole relationship is inappropriate. I don't want to be a part of this. What options does Rhoda have? So this is obviously the issue that I noted here in number, in number 29, the, in, the issue of optional and mandatory withdrawal from representation. Unquestionably, we saw it in the first source, as far as the Substitute Decisions Act is concerned, the person shall be deemed to have capacity to retain and instruct counsel. Even if they don't have capacity, doesn't matter. We are giving them that ability, and then when the judge hears whatever it is that she's putting forth, it'll be up to the judge to make a decision on the, uh, on the claims and on the, uh, the, the moves that she's making. The judge is going to review the orders in the end. From an access to justice perspective, as I brought you here in source number 30 from the, uh, actually, no, sorry, the um, first Number 30, from the Rules of Professional Conduct, a lawyer shall not withdraw from representation of a client except for good cause and on reasonable notice to the client. Commentary. Although the client has the right to terminate the lawyer-client relationship at will, the lawyer does not enjoy the same freedom of action. Having undertaken the representation of a client, the lawyer should complete the task as ably as possible unless there is justifiable cause for terminating the relationship. We talked about this a little bit 
in our session on uh, enabling the client to sin. What do you do if your client is doing something that you as a lawyer may feel is against Jewish law and that you, you know, personally offends your conscience? What is your, what is your role and what are your rights? If you take a look at source number 31, this speaks to the issue behind um, prohibiting you from withdrawing. The authors of the Law of Lawyering make the following comments about the differences between the American model rules of professional conduct and the restatement of the law governing lawyers in Canada. Other listed reasons for permissive withdrawal are more controversial and should be employed with correspondingly more caution, precisely because the breakup of the client-lawyer relationship can less clearly be laid at the client's door. Indeed, for withdrawals based on these grounds, the restatement specifically requires recalibration of the competing harms. If the harm to the client significantly exceeds the harm to the lawyer or others that prompted the impulse to withdraw, withdrawal is no longer permissible. There are certain grounds for withdrawal that are more controversial and that require a higher standard in order to be able to withdraw. A chief example is withdrawal in the face of client choices that the lawyer finds repugnant or imprudent. Read too broadly, these provisions would permit lawyers to abandon clients at the first sign of disagreement or unpleasantness, which is antithetical to what a proper client-lawyer relationship should be. Clearly, lawyers ought to give clients the benefit of the doubt and not withdraw unless the disagreement is fundamental and the client's position so extreme as to be nearly impossible for most reasonable lawyers to countenance. So, in other words, it's really hard to withdraw on the grounds of, I think this is a bad decision. The, um, certainly on the grounds of it being a bad decision. For you to say, I don't think this is a good decision, is irrelevant. Even if you find it repugnant, we're saying here, it's very hard within the system to be able to withdraw. And so normal practice is to continue to serve, even if the lawyer personally believes that the client lacks capacity, and even if the lawyer personally believes that the client's instructions, if followed, would be detrimental to her interests. So what do you do? From a, from a Jewish perspective, right, it's very clear, I think, what the, um, what the, what the approach in, in general law is. What, what, is a, you know, what, what is the position of Jewish law on this? So it's important to recognize this is not only about fairness to the mother and her, issues, and her wishes. It's also about fairness to the lawyer. Right? If the lawyer believes that this woman is being abused in the relationship, and that wasn't specified in the, uh, in the fact scenario I gave, but if the lawyer believes that she's being abused, if the lawyer believes that she's being taken advantage of, then the lawyer is personally being told to aid in that. Right? It's, not, it's not as simple as saying, well, that's what the client wants. The lawyer is now an accessory to it in the lawyer's own mind. And that's the problem in general in any matter of professional ethics. Um, you have a web of different duties. You have a duty to the profession. You have a duty to the client. But you also have a duty to self. And from a Jewish law perspective, you have a prior duty to God. So you, know, you have a serious problem. We have a principle within Jewish law. That lifnei ver lo titain mechshol. You're not allowed to put a stumbling block in front of the blind. The lawyer is going to say, that's what I feel like I'm doing. By enabling her to proceed in this relationship, by having her give away half her cottage, I feel like I am causing her to stumble. What am I supposed to do? We read before the source that says, don't stand by while somebody is being hurt. Not only is the lawyer standing by, the lawyer is actually enabling it to move forward. So what does the lawyer do in a, in a case like this? So one argument that could be brought to justify staying in is an argument I mentioned a while back when we talked about confidentiality issues. Rabbi Dr. Alfred Cohn, in an article in the Journal of Halakha and Contemporary Society dealing with issues of confidentiality, makes the argument that there can be a need of the profession that supersedes the need of any one individual. Meaning, in the context of confidentiality, you'll tell me that by keeping a secret for a particular client, I am harming other people who would have, uh, who would, who would have benefited from knowing the secret. Whatever it is, financial, physical, you can come up with cases. So he argues, though, that in the event that you actually break confidentiality, you bring a bad name upon the profession of law in general, 
you cause people not to trust their legal representatives, and society needs a viable system of representation in which clients trust their lawyers. And therefore, the argument may be made that the individual has to sacrifice for the sake of the community, because we find that in Jewish law in other cases. So that's an argument that he makes in in the context of confidentiality for not breaking confidentiality, even knowing that somebody is going to be hurt by it. I have difficulty, though, applying that here. And the reason I have difficulty applying that here is because there, at least, it's a matter of inaction. In other words, don't convey the, uh, the information to somebody who really could use it. But here, you're actively helping her to do something. You are conveying orders on her behalf that could potentially cause her harm. So I have a hard time with that. Uh, I have a hard time with that idea. A second argument that you could make here, and we alluded to it already, is that Section 3 counsel is not the one who's supposed to decide whether the orders are good or not. Right? That's the job of the judge. Your job is to put forth the ideas, not the ideas, the instructions, and it's the judge's responsibility to review it and evaluate capacity and evaluate whether this is a reasonable thing. Or I don't, I don't, I don't know enough to say what the judge is evaluating. I'm going to uh, stop before I say something that's incorrect. The, um, but the judge is going to be the one who's going to, who's going to have to weigh in and decide whether this goes forward or not. So maybe it's legitimate for the lawyer to say, that's not my headache. It's not my, that's not my issue. So it's true, the lawyer's role is indirect. However, from a Jewish law perspective, that may not be sufficient. Take a look, please, at source number 32. Talks about a case in which a fire spreads and harms somebody else's property. So Maimonides, quoting the Talmud, says the following. If he, the person who is involved in our, in our, in our case of a fire, he fans the flame. But the wind also fanned the flame, and so the flame spread. He, the person who fanned the flame, is liable, for he caused it. Commenting on Maimonides' position, Rabbi Avram ben David comments and says, wait, the Talmud added a key piece of information, which is that one is liable for fanning the flame if his fanning alone could have done this, could have caused it to spread. But otherwise, he is, in fact, exempt from liability. It's only if you are the one who is necessary to it, then, then it's true. But if you're not the one who is necessary to the spread of the fire, then you know what? And not only, I'm sorry, not only not necessary, if you're fanning alone, sorry, that's not what he's saying. He didn't necessary. say necessary. Sufficient. Sufficient, correct. Sufficient, not necessary. If his fanning was sufficient to have done it alone, then he would be liable but otherwise not. Nonetheless, what emerges here is that even though you weren't the sole player, you're still going to be held responsible. And to give a case that's closer to litigation, take a look at source number 33, a case involving witnesses from the Shulchan Aruch, from the Code of Jewish Law. You, you're, you, are, you want to testify. Courts of Jewish Law require two witnesses as a set. So you are a valid witness, a kosher witness, as phrased here. There's somebody who's going to testify alongside you as part of your set. And you know that this person is either unqualified to testify or outright lying. However, you agree with the testimony. In other words, you witnessed a particular transaction. You witnessed a document, you witnessed witnessed a sale, whatever it was. You believe that these things that you're going to say are true. Somebody else comes along to be part of the set, claiming to be the second witness. You know full well that he wasn't there. You know that he's lying. However, you believe that what he's saying is valid. So do you let him testify? Because after all, what he's saying is valid. Or do you say, no, he's a false witness. I can't, I can't go along. So the Code of Jewish Law, the Shulchan Aruch, says the following. Even a kosher witness who knows that his fellow witness is wicked, but the judges do not recognize his wickedness. He may not testify with him, even though he knows the testimony is true. So that's number one, where the witness should be invalid because of personal disqualification, because of his personal character. And it goes without saying regarding a kosher witness who knows testimony for someone and knows that the second witness with him is lying. He may not testify. 
you can't be part of a set of witnesses with somebody who is acting inappropriately, even though you could make the argument, it's not on my head, let the judge cross-examine. The judges in a rabbinical court have the responsibility to examine the witnesses and determine any impropriety. So why is it my headache? I'm just a witness telling the truth, and he's not my concern. But the answer is it doesn't work that way. So on that basis, the, um, you can definitely make the argument that Jewish law is going to say you have to exercise whatever options you have to withdraw here and not to, uh, and not to continue representing such a client. Now, in the event that withdrawing would leave the client in a worse state, that's a different story. Because then you're actually harming the person you're trying to help. And that goes back to the Rule 3.7 in general. Number two, if this would seriously endanger the lawyer's livelihood, one would not be obligated to withdraw in order to protect the client. And that's an overall principle, Rabbi Eliezer Waldenberg and others discuss this in response on related issues, that the, um, the desire to protect the client in this case would not override the need for the lawyer to be able to make a living. So in the event that withdrawal would bring censure, the lawyer would not be obligated to, uh, to do so. Um, however, this does show the extent to which the lawyer is responsible from a Jewish law perspective. From a, from a Canadian law perspective, that's not your concern. You're a Section 3 counsel, let the judge you know, figure it out. From a Jewish ethics perspective, I think it's a lot more problematic. I saw a couple of questions. I'm just going to do a very fast summary because I know that people may, uh, may want to go. Um, but I also want to make sure there are three sign-in sheets. There's one here, there's one there. Maybe there are two over there. Um, please make sure that you do sign in if you're going, and also see the flyers for the big program coming up on December 25th, a full day of uh, study of Tanakh, half-hour classes, free of charge. So um, see that as well. And now I'm going to take questions and so on. If people have to leave, then, they, uh, then they're able to do so, but please then do so quietly. Yes? Okay. The problem I have with the case you just talked about, the yeah. Jewish perspective, is let's say you have a fantastic witness a from person and highly credible and the defense knows they're going to come forward and it's going to devastate them so they kind of finagle the way of getting another witness to come in who is obviously going to lie and it's going to put the credible witness in the position of having to back out and this is a way nipped it in the bud got rid of the good witness how do you approach that and this is this is a rabbinical court or this is a, I mean, this this a rabbinical is a, court no a regular court well a regular court isn't going to need two witnesses anyway okay so, so a they're not going to have an issue in a rabbinical court you have to report it to the judges and let the judges sort it out that's what he would have to do. It's not a matter of withdrawing his testimony. It's a matter of falling foul on the uh, on the false witness. Does that happen? Yeah. This sort of thing. Yes. I mean, it's supposed to. How often and it happens? Then it goes, is another and then the judge is the diameter. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Jared. In the case before, in the secular courts, you're describing the uh, there's an assumption there of the phenomenon of black lawyer in the city. Yeah. Right? You're assuming that, that this is the, the last guy he can represent. If you can find a replacement and step out gracefully and replace yourself with a lawyer who might be willing to wish to take his place, is that not a viable solution? Sorry, say this again? If you can find... If, if somebody else can replace you as a yeah. section free counsel, yeah. is that not a viable solution? Or are you still putting the stumbling block in front of the block <coughs> by offering up a different lawyer? Right, so as a general principle, referring to somebody else if required to do so is not wonderful, but on the other hand is allowed. The, uh, that comes up in medical practice quite a bit. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.